You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on L.A. Talk Radio. Welcome to Question Reality. I'm your host, Priscilla Leona, and we are coming to you live from Los Angeles, California. Our show is broadcast every Sunday from 5 p.m. to 5.50 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. If this is your first time tuning in, our show will help you to question your career reality. Now, this show was created entirely to inspire, motivate, and educate people who've decided to pursue a career in the entertainment industry. And we've selected guests that work in various professions of show business and are at various stages of their careers. So that means that you'll hear from celebrities, award winners and nominees, behind the scenes professionals, as well as the novice and uh, or beginner in order to provide a more realistic viewpoint of the trials and tribulations of a chosen professions in show business. And we We've been on the air since 2008, and we've had some very impressive entertainment industry professionals on our show. So I highly recommend that you go to our website archive page, find a profession that you're interested in hearing about, and either instantly download it or listen to it uh, right away. They have a play button or a download button, so you can do either or. Now, I have been waiting for this guest since 1977. I didn't know it because I was a child, but I I've been wanting, dreaming, and sending it out there, and sure enough, he is on the show today. Everybody is excited and thrilled to have this man's voice come across my airwaves. His name is Anthony Dyson, or Tony Dyson. He is a he is an incredible. Oh, uh, there there are no words. Words have not been invented yet to describe Anthony Dyson. Basically, you know who he is, but just in case you don't, he is the man behind the character R2-D2 of the iconic movie Star Wars. And this he is so versatile. He's an Emmy-nominated film special effects supervisor, and he's also uh, the creative genius at the helm of many of the biggest sci-fi movies to date, such as Superman 2, Moonraker, Dragon Slayer, and of course, The Empire Strikes Back. And when it comes to robot technicians, Tony is quite unique, as you all know. Now, not only is he responsible for building one of the most famous robots ever, our beloved R2-D2, but he's also designed and built robots for some of the largest electronic companies in the world, such as Sony, Philips, and, of course, my laptop, Toshiba. Love it. We'll never even get another laptop other than Toshiba, just the best products ever. And you can find examples of Tony's creations on permanent display in one of the most prestigious museums in the world. What else? The Smithsonian Institution. And R2-D2, for for those of you who don't know, was one of the very first robots to be honored in the Carnegie Mellon University Robot Hall of Fame. So there you go, a little tidbit of trivia. And Tony was also nominated for an Emmy for a Sony television commercial. So we are going to talk to Tony in one little baby second. I want you to go to his website right now, TonyDyson.com, T-O-N-Y-D-Y-S-O-N.com. He also has another website, which you can check out that you may not know about, and it's called bobakinworld.com, and that's B-O-B-B-E-K-I-N. W-O-R-L-D.com. He also has a website, fairycrystals.com. That sounds cool. And he's on Facebook as Tony. Tony Dyson. On Twitter as the Robot Master. Love that. Very kinky. That sounds like something I could use on a Saturday night. The Robot Master. And also on Wikipedia, Anthony John. Dyson. So now, without further ado, I feel like I need an applause track, which I do not have. Yay! Woo! Thank you! Thank you! The, without further ado, let's bring on the man himself, the one, the only, there is no other until the end of time, Anthony Dyson. Thank you, Anthony Dyson, for being on my show. It's a pleasure, my love. It's a pleasure. My 
God, did we ever think you would be on my radio show? No, we did not. My husband is just thrilled. Everybody knows. My God, you're an icon. How does it feel to be who you are? You must wake up every day, look in the mirror, and you must be all over yourself. You must say, my God, I'm so happy to be that's me. So, that's so true, actually. To be quite honest with you, I've got two mirrors. I never think one mirror is enough. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. Yeah. I have a couple of them, and I always find the one on the right is always right, and the yes. one on the left, well, what the hell? Yes, and do you also go mirror, mirror on the wall? Who's the fairest? Absolutely, of them? <laughs> absolutely. Actually, I could do it a bit of snow at the moment. We've just got our summer now, because you know I live uh, in Malta. Yes, uh, in the Mediterranean. Yeah, yeah. You know, I um, had to look up. I said, "Where the hell is Malta? What? <laughs> what the hell's going on?" Well, I thought you would probably have to hide yourself over there tony because people would be clamoring around your house and climbing your walls and trying to steal your underwear is that why you moved there they used to do that but of course i live on a small island called gozo which is even smaller than malta and malta is small enough Uh, (laughs) i live by the sea and we have quite a few other um what you call celebrities live here on the island quite a few actually even brad pitch bought a house here wow Yep, 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 yep. So it's the up and coming. So, so you probably, um, you probably feel quite safe and secure on the island. Do you feel oh, that? Yeah. Do you feel yeah. like it's better for you mentally? Do you feel like a, a charge of energy? Because people say that when they live by the ocean, they do get a sense of of peacefulness, and they're more clear and lucid in their writing and designing abilities. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've been very lucky. I've been living here for twenty five years now. Wow. Um, and I can just fly out of here to anywhere I want to if I'm going to a, a, a con or a conference or giving a lecture. It's very, wow. very easy. So now, I can come back to my home base. And, um, yeah, it's very relaxing. Yeah, now, very nice. ob- obviously, as I told you earlier, you sound, of course, like <laughs> Paul McCartney. So you're British. Of course, everybody sounds like Paul McCartney, who's a man to me. But you're obviously from England. Uh I hope you're from England. God, I hope you're from England. <laughs> um, and uh, you grew, tell us about life as a child. Did you always know as a child that you wanted to design robots? What exactly no, was... No, I, I thought I was going to be on stage uh, on the other side of the uh, camera. That was my, my dream. Um, in the UK, I don't know if they had it in the States, but in the UK we used to have what's called Saturday morning minors. Um, and it was filmed especially for children. And the whole idea, really, at the cinema, the idea was that mums and dads could throw their kids out and get a weekend a bit of freedom, you know. So right. my mother joined in that club. She thought it was a great idea to get rid of me because I was a bit of a handful. And she sent me and my sister to Saturday Morning Miners. And I fell in love with the, with the theatre. I fell in love with the films. I used to see, of course, all the American films and Jet Man and all kinds of B-movies that used to come over to the UK. Um, and about that time, I mean, I was, what, two, blah, 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 about seven or eight. Um, and I actually knew, you know, I wanted to be on film. And so I just worked at that. Uh, that was my dream. Um, yeah. As it turned out, I thought I'd be in the film. And it turned out I was behind the camera instead. Well, what happened? Didn't you get? Didn't you go? Uh, did you try to go on auditions or go and be in plays or anything? Were you ever actually on the stage? Did you get a little feel I of did, that? I, I did a couple of uh, what we call cameos, but basically that was even afterwards when I, I was known more. Um, my 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 idea behind it was I would do the same as I'd read in some of these magazines. Try to work on the uh, the set. And then work my way into, you know, the acting side or dancing side. In them days, we used to have singing and dancing. Um, but that died quite, quite after I was interested in. Um, so the idea really at the beginning was to work my way in um, without going for lots and lots of auditions. Um, Harrison Ford did something similar. He was a carpenter. Um, and he got all the inside information that way, which is a very cool way of getting inside information, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and I enjoyed it so much. Um, I probably also realized I didn't have the talent. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, no. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, true, true. I have to admit to it. I, I didn't have the talent. Um, I never really tried that hard after a while. You right. know, I, I didn't actually go to or even attempt to go to RADA, mm-hmm. uh, though I knew the name and I could always impress girls by saying, you know, I'm going to go to RADA. <laughs> 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 and they go, really? Really? 
but, uh, I, don't, I didn't even apply, but I just told all the girlfriends I was going to go to RADA. Yeah. Uh, and then later on, as I said, I, I went to the studios. First time I went to the studios was my, my sister was working for the telephone exchange as a, a telephonist in them days. We used to have nice girls, nice voices, answer the phone for you. You know, you pick up the phone and say, I want a number, and they would dial it for you. Uh, way before, of course, with electronic stuff I've got now. Yeah. Um, and she was doing a, a job just outside of London. Um, I can't remember exactly what it was. But she rung me at the weekend, and my parents had gone off for the weekend. And she said, I found Pinewood Studio. Well, Pinewood Studio didn't know it was lost, but we didn't quite know what it was. And she said, it's just outside of London. And she told me how to get there. So I got on my scooter. Uh, I was a mod in them days when we had mods and rockers. And it's going back a, a long, long time, you know, when we used to have steam engines as well. Right. Uh, I, got on my, I got on my scooter and I actually found it very easy. It was she dead right. I mean, straight down the M40 and just turned off to the left. Um, so I guess down there and there's this great big man at the gate stopping, of course, anybody who wants to get in there. Um, and I said, look, look, it's important. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work in a film, which you might as well let me go by. And I don't really mind if I'm sweeping the floor. I just need to get in there. <laughs> <laughs> so for some obscure reason, God knows why, he ignored me. And after a while, he, he didn't just ignore me. He told me to uh, uh off. So, <laughs> very disappointed, very disappointed teenager. <laughs> got on, on a scooter and came back home. And I think on the way home, if I recall, the evidence opened up and there was a storm and I was soaked and fed up and getting off my bike and oh. Anyway, some years later, uh, I was deciding I was going to do my own thing and I started making rocking horses. You know, the, the horse on a, on a rocker? Yeah. The Victorian type of things, yeah. And I was doing that in my, in my garage. And in between doing that, I kept on ringing the studios because I, you know, I really wanted to push this. <laughs> um, well, Bray Studios, I don't know if you've ever heard about Bray Studios in the UK. No. It's where they used to make the Hammer Horror films. Ah. You remember the Hammer Horror with um, Christopher Blee and all that lot? Anyway, yes. they used to make these horror films there. And it was a very small studio, but that's where they made them, and it was pretty famous for that. And it was very small. And I rang there, and I rang there, and I couldn't get past the, uh, the dragon at the telephone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and eventually, I think she felt really sorry for me, and she oh. put me through to one of the um, the floors, one of the shop floors. And the guy that picked up the phone, again, I was lucky, um, had only been working there a short time. So I told him I wanted to work at the studio. He said, have you got a green card? I, a I, green I, I, card? It was a, a, a union card, you know. Oh. Um, and I said, well, how do you get a union card? I, I, I haven't got one. He said, well, you've got to work on a film. <laughs> I said, well, how do you get to work on a film if you haven't got a card? He said, that's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going, yeah, this conversation's getting me a long way, this one, you know. Yeah. So we had it, we carried on talking, and he, he was having fun. It was obviously his tea break. Um, so at the end, I said, well, look, it's obvious I can't do this. I can't get a union card if I'm not on a film. I can't get on a film if I've got a union card. He said, well, I've got a solution. I said, now you tell me. Now you tell me. <laughs> He said, well, look, four or five weeks ago, I was actually working in a model shop in Windsor. I said, yeah, okay. He said, and now I'm working in a studio. I said, well, yeah, I've just wrong you. I know you're working in a studio. Mm. So he told me all about special effects. And it was the time, uh, 1977, when special effects were coming into their own because directors couldn't cope with all the work they had to do with all the special effects. You know, because you've got pyrotechnics, you've got makeup special effects, you've got mold special effects. And the list just goes on and on and on. Um, and they couldn't really direct all these groups. So they were bringing up the idea of having a director specifically to take care of the special effects groupings. And also they couldn't take care of the work because there were so many films coming up with special effects at the time. And the Space Nine, 99, Alien was just coming up because I, I worked on that for a while. Um, so they will bring people in from outside because that's the easiest way to do it. And, of course, they can't all have union cards. And he said, that's how I got it. I'm an expert, he said, on, uh, I think it was operating, what, mold radio models, you know, helicopters and things like that. So they brought him in the studio. He didn't have a card, but he was working for the external uh, special effects. He said, so that's the way you can get in there, get into special effects, because I had no idea about any of this. It's all new news to me. Right. He said, get into that and everything will be okay. I said, okay, fine. Got any names? He said, yes, I have got a name. 
So he gave me a couple of names around these people. Brian Johnson was one of them. And he said, yes, we're always looking for talent. Bring some moles along with you. And I, I, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> and that was it. Put the phone down on me. <laughs> well, it gets, it gets worse, kid. It gets worse. Because I didn't make models. I mean, I wasn't the model person. Yeah. You know, I didn't even get the kits. I didn't do any of that what? stuff. What, did so, they just teach you? Did they say, here, uh, this is what you no, do? No, 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 no. What happened was I was making this rocking horse, I told you, and it was. I made the first one in wood, and that really started splitting up with the um, central heating in the UK, and it cracked. It was terrible. So I decided to make them in fiberglass. That's the kind of thing you put on your cars or make bonnets or make racing cars with, yeah? Fiberglass, reinforced plastic. Right. So I was making their molds for this, and I was learning how to do mold work, and it's a closed mold, and it's very, very tricky. And I'd got over that problem. I was halfway through making this horse, and it wasn't painted. I didn't have a spray booth. So he told me to come in about a week's time. So I started painting this rocking horse, and it's a big rocking horse in black, by hand, with a brush. <laughs> and I was hitting it from one side to the other because of the brush strokes were really terrible. But right. it flowed quite nicely. And every single day, every single hour, I was tipping it, painting it, tipping it. For seven days I did that until you couldn't see a brush mark at all. It looked incredible. Um, I don't know how it would have worn out, but it, it looked felt pretty good. So I put it in the back of my car, and I took that along. And I showed that to Brian Johnson, and he loved it. He was crazy over it. In actual fact, he bought my first rocking horse. And that's when he turned around and said, I've got some jobs coming up. <laughs> Whoa! I'm going like, what? Wow, yeah. So what? it was getting pretty obvious now that he wasn't going to give me a specific job in the studio. He was expecting me to set up a studio outside. So I didn't argue with him. I mean, that's what he thought I would do. So I, yeah, 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 fine. So he said, look, I've got this uh, sort of space opera coming up soon, uh, but it will be another ooh, eight months. But you need to do something in between. I said, yeah, I'd love to do something in between, right? <laughs> so what he did, he gave me a name down at Pinewood Studio, uh, Derek Meddings, who did all the uh, Bond films and got all the awards for the Bond films. He said, go down there, say that I sent you, and he'll probably give you some work. I said, I'm not going down there. I've been there before. And they told me to F off. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so two years before that, right? Right. So, he said, you tried the front door, the gate. I said, yeah. Yeah. He said, oh, silly boy. You should go in the second gate. He said, they've got a man there in the little box. He doesn't want to leave the box because, he, you know, he likes sitting down on his bottom. I said, all you had to do, he said, drive up, nod as if you actually know him, and drive straight through. <laughs> that's exactly what I did. I'm not oh. joking. That's exactly what I did. And on the right-hand side, there's this huge studio, and it's got 007 written on it. <gasps> I'm going like, oh, oh, it's a monster, it's a monster studio, it's a monster studio. I couldn't believe it. I was absolutely, I mean, uh, 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 you know? Right, I spent, right. I spent hours there, just walking around, knocking on doors, talking to people, right? Yeah. Um, at the end, I actually found Derek, told him where I'd been sent over. He said, oh, I'm working on a film called Moonbreaker. And uh, would you like to make all the space models in it? <laughs> so I'm saying yes. And of course, I walk away, get in the car, and I'm shaking, totally, utterly shaking. Because I had no idea how to make these space models. I didn't make any models in all my life, yeah? So that was absolutely murder. It didn't come up straight away. So I went back to, to uh, Johnson, and he said, well, we spent a couple of days down here. We're doing a film called Alien. And uh, the studios like it very, very much. So we might have to even refilm it again. And they're also they were doing Space 1999 at the time as well down there. So I spent a few more days down there, and I'm starting to get into this. You know, this is pretty cool, you know? Um, but all the time, I was terrified. It was, it was a, a very weird sensation. You know, one side, I'm really excited because I'm working on films that appear. I mean, especially the James Bond. I've always found I knew about the James Bond films. But I didn't know about the space operas. I didn't know about Alien. I didn't know about those. Uh, I didn't know Alien was going to be such a fantastic hit. Um, but at the same time, I couldn't really find myself out. But I do these jobs. I didn't have an outside studio at all. So what I had to do is literally uh, rent space, find model makers, hire them, 
which I've never done in my life before, and get them to make the models for, the, for uh, Moonraker and yeah, all the other jobs I got, you know. And that's basically how I started. That is incredible, but that was ingenious. You didn't know how to do it, so you hired people to do it. That was a great idea. That's ingenious. <laughs> oh, my God. I think I would have done the same exact thing. Oh my God, that's great. So when we get to... Uh, obviously, you're hired to uh, start working on Star Wars um, at some point. At some point, yep. so when you when you were hired to work on Star Wars, I assume that you had quite a bit of credibility, or at least the people who work for you did built up your <laughs> your credibility. Oh. So yeah. you 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 know, were you asked to lead the team or? No, in actual fact, what I did, I set myself a company up. Um, all the people working for me had never worked in the film industry. A couple had worked on rodeo with uh, bands and groups. I think two of them, if I remember right, had done that. That was the only ones that had any experience whatsoever. The rest were just pattern makers, the people that make the patterns for producing cars or producing products. So they could actually do the carving and make the mold that way. Um, so my first job was actually to teach myself. I knew I had to do fiberglass work, and I'd made these molds I told you for the rocking horse. Right. But, you know, I found I did have actually some sort of uh, gift when it came to the building stuff. And I found also very, very quickly that if I didn't learn all the trades within my studio, there'd be a little chance of me being as good as I wanted to be. Um, at the end, of it, I, start, I ended up with 40 people working, in actual fact, in my studio. And I just kept on you know, buying another or renting another um, room, another part of the uh, estate. And we just grew and grew and grew. We carried on making the rocking horses. We carried on making molds for museums as well in between because the films aren't always guaranteed to be there. Um, and then the commercials. So the commercials actually, funny enough, are much more profitable than the films are, strange enough. Um, the biggest problem was always going in and giving a price because I wasn't working in the studio as such. So they would ring me up and I would pop down the studio. They'd say, Tony, we've got this idea. They'd either draw something like the Sony robot, was supposed to be a uh, lookalike for John Cleese, you'll find on my website. Um, and that was a great project to do. And that was actually on the back of a cigarette packet because apparently they were looking for me. And Sony <laughs> wanted to have the best of the best, and they, you know, for some silly reason, they thought I would be the best person to make a robot. So when they actually found me, they only had three weeks left. They said, we've been trying to find you. I said, why three weeks? Why is it with a watch, you know? Oh, we've been looking for him. We couldn't find you. I thought I wasn't hiding. <laughs> was here, you know. So that was on the back of a cigarette packet. So I had to design that, you know, from scratch. Sometimes you've got a half an idea. You know, the director or the art department know some sort of uh, clue to what they wanted. And then you had to actually make it into a reality. Um, and you also had to come up with a price. And I think really my biggest nightmare always for the whole period was coming up with a price. Because you don't know, you've never made it. They're all one-offs, you know. So how the hell do you know how long it's going to take and how much it's going to cost? Mm. So that was, that was the nightmare side. That was even more so than actually making the items, even though that was very, very tricky. And lots of my guys would go, no, 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 we're not doing that. No, no, we're not doing that. Right. I said, we are. I've just got the contract for it. We're doing it. We're doing it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, uh, wait, it's so many hard. decisions. You're, you just uh, you have to think on the fly. That's how it is in the entertainment industry. I mean, they offer yeah. you things, and you got to just do it. So R2-D2 also uh, obviously is, my God, everyone, even if you don't speak uh, English and you live in a foreign country and maybe you haven't even seen the movie they've heard of r2d2 i hear so my yep. question i have some questions now they're going to be very very layman and, and i hope that they're okay but these are questions that i personally came up with because they have always perplexed me okay so the first one i want to know is what did all of those beeps mean? I mean, how do people understand what he meant? You know, did they have like a universal translator? Was it sort of Morse code or was it supposed to be known that it was taught in school? But what did those beeps mean, Tony? Uh, okay, that's an easy one. Oh, good. Oh, you want the answer? Oh, oh yes! Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do! Okay, 3CPO, the golden one, the golden android, yes. who had an, uh, Anthony uh, inside it. Um, he was the translator. 
That's the reality of it. He was supposed to be the translator. He was a universal translator. And that's why they had the own conversations. But other ones, everybody else, all the other characters, were basically working on the principle that if it's a short one, it's a short answer. If it's a long verb, it's a long answer. Um, and he would actually talk to the computer. He'd plug himself into the computer. But no, the translator was 3 CPO for sure. Uh. I see. Oh, I'm going to have to revisit that film and listen to that because yeah. uh, it seems like that humans could understand what he's After a while, they got used to it. Yeah, you can get a translator, actually. There's a translator um, online. Did okay. you know that? No. There is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me yeah. see if I can find it. Go on. Okay. Okay. And um, as I said, I have my co-host Ben Padden on the line, and he has some questions. Ben, why don't you Hello. Take- question for Mr. Dyson. Yeah, I mean, one of the things um, that I've been uh, very interested in is that there's been kind of a resurgence in uh, the use of physical models recently. Um, As as you may have heard, J.J. Abrams is directing uh, Star Wars Episode 7. He's he's built a lot of physical models and sets for that as opposed to, you know, the the, the prequel trilogies. And there's been a, uh, there are a lot more more physical models used in films like Moon and in the recent 10th season of Red Dwarf uh, in the UK. Uh, Where do you stand on the, the, the CG versus model debate, do you prefer seeing um, a solid actual model in a movie, or do you think the benefits of computer-generated creations and scenery outweigh the cons? Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Very, very good. Um, Thanks, I saw, it took, I took a long time <laughs> thinking about it. <laughs> before I actually say what my personal preference is, um, I think the most important thing is to understand what the director's like. There's quite a few directors, as there is um, actors not wanting to work on sci-fi films, um, pretty much for the same reason. The biggest problem we're working with the computer generated is you're talking about blue screen nearly all the time or green screen. And a lot of actors don't like it because they don't get the mood. They're certainly in, a, in a, a blank room with all these green screens around them. And directors are very much the same. And it's even worse for a director <laughs> because the director has some photographs you know, uh, or sketches of what's going to be in that scene, but they can't see it until it's finished and made. So it's extremely difficult for them to get in the mood. They just have to go by um, uh, the storyboard. So that makes them feel very much isolated. And there's only certain directors even will contemplate it because they're saying, oh, this, this is going to turn around. There's going to be a big monster. Look up that way. And we have a flag to show where to look at. So I feel very, very sorry for quite a few directors. Because of that reason, there is certain directors will not work with CG. And there's a lot of actors will turn it down unless the money is incredibly good. For that reason, Um, if you leave those two reasons behind, which are tricky for some actors, tricky for some directors, personally, it depends on how they do the CG. Some of it is amazing. I mean, totally amazing. The biggest problem I find with any film is that if they overdo it, because they can do anything with CG, um, sometimes they're overdoing it. And this happens with, you know, all the best films. Um, they get complicated, let's say if it's a franchise, and you're on four or five level of it, and they want to make a more complicated story because they believe they should do. But if you talk to fans, which I talk to a hell of a lot of them when I go around the world, um, they'll all turn around and say the same thing. You know, let's say the Star Wars second film was one of the best ones, and, and so on, the same with uh, Lord of the Rings, because they get more personal with the actual characters. When we get a big, big group and a big, complicated story, you really don't get into the characters. And the same thing when you have a lot of CG in there, sometimes it can really take away from the story. And it ends up being all special effects and no storyline. So one has to be very careful. I prefer models as I prefer characters. I prefer both. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the puppets, I, I mean, still today, if you look at the old Star Wars movie, the first ones, I think the puppets just really are more, I don't want to say human because they're not supposed to be human, but it's just more of a... Um, a there's a physicality. Yes, a physicality, pro- more of a connection. I I just really wish that they would cut down on the, on the CGI. As a matter of fact, Tony, I wanted to ask you, how do you feel about how R2-D2 is now sort of um, personified or treated in the prequels. Now, as far as lines and involvement, I personally feel that in the last three movies, uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO, I don't think they were given enough visibility or involvement. And to me, it made a noticeable difference overall about the feel of the story. How do you feel? 
that well, uh, well, I feel the same way about the characters. I mean, the two characters are characters. That's all there is to it. You know, they um, that's what became uh, they're known for for having an actual character, even though they're machines. Um, and if you go back to what I was just saying, that we lose the characters when it gets too big, when the storyline gets too big, when the the whole idea of the production gets too big, when you spend too much money on the on time, as also on the CG. Um, you haven't got time for the characters. So I don't think they were specifically aimed at making less of them. I think they were just dropped as um, we would like to see more of them. Like, we'd still like to see the characters more. Yes. We would like to see the actual actors more um, and get to know the characters better because there are new characters and more. if they were younger, they were new in many ways. Um, so no, I don't think they were attacking those uh, particular characters. I think they were just going again, extending themselves too far. They felt you, they had to give more and more and more. Yeah, it seems like they just want to put action, 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 yeah. and uh, it's trying just, to be better than the last. And exactly. It doesn't who I talk to, they all say the same thing. You know, the last film was too much. Yes. You know? I, and, I think I think that the biggest uh, issue with R two D two and C three P O in the prequel t- uh, trilogy is that a lot of the story of those three films doesn't make a lot of sense, and it just kind of feels like C three P O and R two D two are just they're just there because you know they're recognizable, and they keep they kept giving R two D two all of these new features and letting him like hover and kind of almost transform at times it just it just seemed uh it was like like the old superman comics you know back in the day during the golden age where they would just give him new powers and new powers and it just it it takes away uh from the character i think when they when they overpower him like that yeah and it didn't make any sense because the whole idea with r2 is that he had lots of owners i mean you know r2d2 is a standard robot yeah that was the whole idea um and the reason why he had these extra gadgets is that each owner puts an extra gadget in there I mean, that was the, the basic idea. But if you're going about uh, saying this is a pre, so why didn't you have the gadgets in Star Wars 1 and 2? Exactly. You know, like, <laughs> it's silly. Like, yeah, exactly. Um, that was, again, only because it was never expected to be so famous. You know, Star Wars was a very low-budget film. Um, very low, indeed. I think it's $4 million. Um, And the reason there was that it was so unusual to do a space opera. So when it called on... They didn't really know where to go from there. So they had to re, let's say, reinvent reality. Um, And so everything got upped, you know. I mean, even building 3CPO, um, that doesn't make any sense because that was supposed to be done by um, one of the evil characters as a hobby when he was a boy. Yeah, it was a Darth Vader build C-3PO as a a boy. That just seems seems pointless. It just felt very unnatural and... uh, It, Convol- was. it was convoluted and contrived, yeah. is the word it I was reaching it, it, for. It almost <laughs> seemed to me, Tony, like, I know this is crazy, but it almost seemed to me like the, the first three that were made were written by someone totally different than the last three. It's almost oh, like it wasn't even the same writer. It's almost like it was a ghost writer that wrote the first three. I know that's crazy and don't come after me, George, but mm-hmm. it just seems like it was not written by the same person at all. It didn't have the same <laughs> feel, nothing. I mean, how can you go from those three? I know technology has advanced, but these three movies seem like they were more geared towards children, like right. children, not adults and children. Right. I Do mean, you know what well, I mean? Yes, I know exactly what you mean. In actual fact, it's true. I mean, most films are written by a crew, a crew of writers. I mean, like all TV programs, you've got seven or eight writers. Um, and then, of course, you've got the director's input, then you've got the producer's input while you're actually filming. Um, the three Star Wars films, the first ones you're talking about, natural fact, were written on set even um, by George. I mean, George was actually changing the uh, storyline as he went along which a lot of people don't realize, but he was, especially in the second film. Um, So it was very hands-on by the man himself. I mean, that's what it came down to. And, of course, then when the studio were putting a lot more money in, they were putting other writers in it. Um, The one I was talking about through CPL, but I didn't like about that particular side, was the fact there was other robots, silver robots, which looked so similar, which they were similar. Yeah. So how come Darth Vader was supposed to do it when I was a kid, when actually fact there was other robots around which looked very much like the one he had built? Um, yeah, it seems like there would be like a like a like a, a trade market or somewhere where you just go and like pick up a robot off the shelf. So it would make sense for you know there to be other robots that look like C three PO and different R two units and so on. But it doesn't make sense that 
you know, that one, no. yeah. R2 did make some sense, except the bit I told you about, that the yeah. owners were changing its usage, um, and that's how it became um, self-aware. I mean, R2 is a self-aware robot. Yeah. That's why it can be called a hero, because he actually makes his mind up to follow you. He doesn't because he's told to do it. That's very, very important. But that came about because he had X amount of uh, owners that gave him these abilities. So he wasn't off the shelf type of thing. But right. I would go backwards on his abilities, um, especially the jetpack, which I did not like personally at all. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge Star Wars fan, and the jetpack moment, and I think yeah. it was in uh, Attack of the Clones of the episode two. Really um, quite um, it yeah, just felt was. it just felt silly. It felt cartoonish, and it really yeah. feels like those the the prequel trilogy was was really more for kids than for people who've yeah. grown up with the Star Wars movies. Yeah, it really yeah. was. Now, now, Tony, my husband heard that in the first uh, uh, Star Trek that in two thousand nine, directed by J.J. Abrams, who is rumored to be a huge Star Wars fan, that R two D two was floating in the debris of the starships as an Easter egg, you know, an Easter egg that's like yeah, some yeah. express. Yeah. And, and, and that it was included as a bonus and um, that it was a tribute to star Wars. Have you heard this rumor and is it true? Yes. I've seen some of the photographs. Yeah. So and that also, is true. <laughs> yeah. There's one, one in, in the transformer one film as well. Oh, I didn't know that about yeah, that. Yeah, R2-D2 oh. is, is snuck into a couple. And actually, the, the Millennium Falcon, I believe, is in another Star, Star Trek movie. Um, yeah. I think Star Trek First Contact. During yeah. the battle, fe- battle with the, 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 the star, there's a fleet of starships all attacking a, a, a Borg cube, the Borg being the kind of the big bad guys of that particular movie. Yeah. And one of the ships, you get this very brief look at the Millennium Falcon as it flies by the camera. It's pretty cool. Exactly. Uh, yeah. That was, they played around a lot there because... I mean, Arthur, as well as being very, very popular by the fans, he was also very popular by George. I mean, George has got one at his ranch, um, and he's pretty got a soft spot for R2-D2, yeah, to yeah. say the least. And because of that reason, it's more of a salute to George as much as it is a salute to R2. You know, you've got to look at that from that point of view. Yeah. Well, my favorite, uh, my favorite one is uh, actually in uh, Red of the Last Ark. Remember that one? I don't, I, I, I don't recall R2 being... Where is he in, in Raiders? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> you must know. Show He's very well show. hidden. I'm sure that there are people listening who know, but I... I, I, I if don't. He's there, I, I haven't seen him. You, you've seen the film, Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, my God. My husband has all of... We've got, he's got the DVDs, the VHSs, and... Oh. and well, when, when you drop into the uh, tomb to actually find uh, the Ark itself... Mm-hmm. Remember? They drop yes. by rope. There's a load of uh, snakes in there. Yes. Yep. Yes? Yes. Yes. Well, I was on that actual set, um, and we lost quite a few snakes. <laughs> a lot of snakes. They just got away. Snakes. They just went. They, they, were, they had other things to do. They, they had other games booked. They got away. We're, I was one of the people who actually going and finding the snakes at pet shops and bringing them in, because we'd never know. Um, and a lot got away, yeah. Uh, well, on that scene, if you go down to when they're actually lifting up the ark itself, there's two or four pillars around uh, the surrounding it. In one of the pillars is carved 3CPO and r 2 d Oh, yes, I had heard that, actually. I had <laughs> heard that. That's my favorite. That's marvelous. That one, I really, really, really love that one. Now I have I have to get in here a couple of questions by your fans because they're just tweeting me here. I mean texting me oh, here. They okay. ask I have to okay. This comes from Lisa from Puxatawney, Pennsylvania, and she said, "Dear Tony, what were some of your design? Dis- I can't talk. There goes the there goes the wild turkey whiskey kicking in. Okay, what <laughs> were what were some of your dis?" design decisions that you're most proud of on R- of R2-D2, and which, if any, do you feel could have been better? Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Um, great question. It is a very good question, actually. Uh, when it comes to a lot of the outside um, paneling, uh, let me explain a little bit about how it came about. R2-D2, uh, the reason why I got the job, I think, was because I designed that rocking horse I told you about, remember, with Brian Johnson? Right. Um, and that was a, what's called a closed mold. Now, it's very difficult to actually get your hand in a closed mold and fasten the joints. You have to come up with special techniques to do it. Um, and so when he realized I had done that, because he's a very clever man, um, he said, look, when we do R2-D2, because I didn't know about R2, he said, we've got to get it strong enough 
to actually carry all the motors and all the equipment inside. And being at a sort of a, a tub, or I think the comedy we say it's like a dustbin, um, it's going to flex, and that's going to be a problem. So can you come up with a solution? So the design which I'm very proud of is actually made two inside, an inside mold and an outside mold. And in between that gap, I put foam, a rigid foam. So that gave it total stability, which is one of the things I'm very, very proud of. The other thing that was very frustrating to actually make, because I made eight of them, eight R2-D2s, um, and I made the master mold, which I could use then on the other films. So that's, it was a big project. Three months, 40 guys working two shifts. So we worked night and day, literally, to actually get it done. So that was one of my great ones. And also, uh, I was telling you about George writing it as he went along. George <laughs> didn't know where all the gadgets would go. Now, this is true. Now, I tell no fibs. He didn't know where the gadgets would go. You know, a little panel opens up and they, an, arm, an extra arm comes out or a drill saw or is going to extinguish the fire in, in the uh, Falcon. He didn't know where it would be. So they're saying to me, look, we have to take these panels off. And I'm going, duh. You know, oh, oh. There's over 200 panels on R2-D2 if you actually count them up. There's over 200. Good grief. So I actually, yeah, there's a lot, man. So I, I had to come up with an idea where the loose panels could be taken off and then we could cut a hole just there and then put the panel back on with the, with the small hinges. And that was the very, very hardest to do. That turned out to be a, a major nightmare for us. Um, if it had just been molded into the framework, it would have been great. But we actually had to have these panels to match it. And also they were made of thermoplastic, you know, the sort of stuff you can melt, not made of fiberglass because they had to go flush and look perfect. Um, and so they had to be vacuum formed. And, of course, then you have to spray paint spray, the, uh, uh, the thermoplastic. And if anybody makes models, they'll know how really hard that it can be because plastic doesn't want to take a, a paint spray without chipping off very easily. So we had to etch them, and that was another problem. The dome was supposed to be uh, aluminium on the prototype. It was tried in aluminium, but then that became much, much too heavy for the motors and the, uh, and the uh, batteries to charge. So I ended up with something else, and that was, I don't know if you look at a lot of... Um, uh, door handles that can be sort of chromed, can't they? They come out sort of silver. It's plastic, but it's got a silver finish to it. <clears throat> so I came up with an idea of using that. I said, oh, great. We'll make the whole dome in plastic, fiberglass. We'll stick it in one of these vacuum machines. And they, what they do is they put it in a vacuum machine and they just melt the, uh, the metal, aluminium, at a very high temperature. And it just literally flies through the air and sticks to the, the plastic. So we did that, and uh, that would take ages to actually solve that one, make that actually work. But that was another challenge. Now, uh, I have uh, another question, which he's saying, why are you not? Robert, I'm going to ask him your question now. Stop texting me, you maniac. Okay, so this is Robert. Robert, okay, Robert from Manhattan. He's like, he says, hey, Tony, did R2... D2, st what did R2-D2 stand for, or why was this name given? Same question for C-3PO. Is it right. explained in the movies, or did it have a behind-the-scenes meaning? Okay, go well, ahead. That, that one's quite a standard one. Um, George Lucas, when he was making a film prior to Star Wars, he was working at the studio and the sound department, and he asked somebody to pass him one of the films or one of the recordings, and it stands for the shelf, so it's rack, so R2, rack 2, D2, and you go along it in alphabetical. And that's exactly where that particular recording was. And when he repeated that a few times, he thought, well, that's got a nice flow to it, R2, D2. That's how he came up with it. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, Even I knew that one. Well, see, <laughs> no. <laughs> Robert, that was a wasted minute for that question. Oh, Robert. That was a wasted Shame question. on you. Okay, um, I have a question, and I'm going to let Ben take the last one, because we're actually, we have two minutes left. I can't believe it. Okay, my question is, um, I, because he and R2-D2 and C-3PO always gave me the impression that they were kind of of a young maturity level, almost like children. And that's what I loved about them. They're, you know, back and forth. If R2-D2 was a person, how old would he be? Like, what would his maturity level be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God! I asked the most weird question! That's oh, a, no! That's a, that is a strange, a strange question. But it is because they seem like children. They were always bickering back and forth. They were always in competition. It seemed like they were like 
children. Because when you reach uh, a certain age, you just stop bickering with people, right? I mean, <laughs> well, let me see, Tony. <laughs> exact line between ten and sixty-seven. Oh no! <laughs> see, That's perfect. I, so you didn't have in. So you don't take that into consider. That wasn't a considering factor when you were given the description. So the it wasn't like okay, well, make the mentality be of. No, it wasn't even a deciding no. factor. No, it wasn't did- really, except for uh, one of the models had a small actor in, Kenny Baker. Uh, and when we put him in there, he was getting that kind of life. I mean, he brought the life to it. I mean, I obviously made the robot, and I'm, I'm very, very happy to have done so. But the real factor um, of the actual character was brought in by Kenny. No question. That and the director, of course, obviously, as always. Okay. Um, that's when that kind of character came in and it was written into it as time went on so again george lucas wasn't quite sure what the robot's going to be like i mean he even had three cpo as a, a british um, car salesman that was the first description well i'm, I'm sure. gonna i'm gonna think of him as young mature uh mature minded uh individuals and then we have one question and then uh ben you can ask and then we gotta we gotta wrap it up but gonna, uh, it's a nice quick, short one Real quick, uh, there was a movie that came out in 1973. It was written by Woody Allen and Marshall Brickman. It was called Sleeper. I don't know if you saw it, Tony, but it was pretty huge. You, are you familiar with it? Yep. Okay. So they had robots in most of the household servants, household keepers. And they. when I saw it, I thought that they resembled and had characteristic traits that were similar to C-3PO. So my question is, did you remember hearing anything around the drawing table, so to speak, that the film, that film was an inspiration for C-3PO? No, not particularly. Um, I think the reason for that is George would never be saying that to anybody openly anyway. <laughs> Because all inventors and geniuses like George uh, <laughs> learn all these things and they sort of inspire the idea they came from outer space and somebody actually told them all about it and it actually does exist somewhere. Oh, so yes. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot imagine George saying, hey, I'm really inspired. Well, I want to do it just like the end of film Sleeper. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen at all. <laughs> but you can see the similarity. I saw the similarity. Yeah, yeah. I saw that. I think okay. every writer and every genius that puts something together is inspired by everybody else before. Yeah, so sure. that's where I think he got the see through up. Okay, so uh, one question, Ben, and then we got to yep. wrap it up. Go. Nice and quick. Uh, you can, this could even be a one word answer. If you could work for any show or movie and have the opportunity to build a robot for them, uh, what show or movie would it be? I have no idea. Good answer. Great. Good stuff. <laughs> Thanks. That was good. I, I dug it. Ah. Question. Hmm? Well, I, 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 I'm very excited about the new Star Wars being directed by J.J. Abrams. Uh, ending question, have you heard anything about them including R2-D2 um, more in these films? Lots. You have not heard. <laughs> well, you, well, Tony, you need to go get the scoop. Tell they've, them. Already, uh, they've already announced R2 is going to be in uh, Episode 7. They already yeah, announced I've, it. I've heard lots and lots, but actually we need another program to tell you all about it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You didn't ask for the question at the right time, did you? I know he's going to be in it, but I was wondering if he had a larger part because we were just talking about him not I, having. I, I, so much. Unbelievable. Just a romantic so I'm going to ask the question myself. If okay. anybody would like to come to the stage to one of the cons, please contact me. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Let's, if do? anyone's listening and want, they yeah. want to get Tony at a convention in the States, get yeah. in touch. Absolutely. Are you serious? Oh my God! I know people that put serious. conventions together. Would you like to? Would you like to do conventions here? Yep. Oh my uh, God! Yep. I can totally I'm help. Doing, I haven't done much in America. Okay. okay. Oh, I will make it happen. I know. Uh, I have lots of celebrity friends who. Um, th- what they do is they put this. They're associated with the the um, uh, celebrities on TV land shows. And I have lots of them go and they sign autographs and stuff. So I'm sure that You're I can. A You're a darling. Oh, Tony, I will be contacting you. We will get you at a convention here for right. sure. Thank you guys so much. We are, we got to end the show. My God, it went so fast. Thank you so much, Ben Padden, for being on the show as co host. If you want to check him out, benpadden.net. Tony, my God, please come back on the show next year. Can I beg you and plead with you? Yep. I'd love to. Yay! And I, you definitely have to come back because I'm going to get you at a convention and I'm going to be showing up and we're going to get pictures of you sitting on my lap. It's going to be a whole to-do. Yippee! 
<laughs> Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. The wonderful, incredible Tony Dyson. Go to his website, TonyDyson.com, and look for him at a convention because I'm going to make it happen. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Say goodbye to your fans, Tony. Bye. But say goodbye to your fans, Ben. Bye, Mom. <laughs> That's your one fan, I know. The one singular. <laughs> Thanks, Tony, for coming on. We'll see you next week on Question Reality. Bye. Bye. You're listening to Question Reality. Question Reality. With Priscilla Leona. Priscilla Leona. Only on LA Talk Radio.